Joe, um, Sheila, um, uh, our directors, Mary, Fiek, Finbar, um, public representatives, members of the Fourth Estate, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Sheila, for that kind introduction. I was born into a Tipperary family, but I was born across the water. Just in the interest of accuracy, I must uh, acknowledge that. Um, whether it is possible to be intellectually rigorous and a politician, well, that would be a subject for uh, another session of the McGill Summer School at some other date. Uh, this summer school, uh, named after Patrick McGill, which it is always an honour to be invited by Joe Mulholland to speak at, is built around the nexus between culture, politics and economics. Indeed, such has been the level of media coverage this week, one would almost think that the Oireachtas, in the full cultural as well as political meaning of the word, had moved to Donegal. There is currently an exhibition in the Hunt Museum in Limerick of the work of Sean Keating, the artist of the Irish Revolution, his Men of the South painting of Sean Moylan and his comrades hangs in my office. Keating was also someone who depicted the building up of the new state, notably in his pictures of the Shannon scheme at Ardna Crusher. In an article written in 1924, he captured the sober pessimism of his time and of ours when he wrote, we ignore our national assets and proclaim our bankruptcy on the housetops. There is a danger in times like these that we focus almost exclusively on the negatives. There are retrenchments that have undoubtedly to be carried out to keep ourselves afloat, rather than the possibilities we have of expanding creativity. As the government document Building Ireland's Smart Economy stated last Christmas, the arts, cultural and creative industries are key economic contributors. As I was opening another exhibition entitled Beware the Jabberwock of animal prints from the Renaissance on in the antiquarian book collection of Marsh's Library, I came across in the catalogue part of a Lewis Carroll verse which read in full also has some application to present times. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from a bus. He looked again and found it was a hippopotamus. If this should stay to dine, he said, there won't be much for us. That sums up pretty well people's fears about available resources being swallowed up by the banking mess, though it is the government's job to ensure through NAMA and otherwise to minimize that risk with legislation due to be published shortly. We have come out of a period that has seen a considerable blossoming of the arts, which have been better resourced in recent times than they had ever been previously. With money relatively more abundant, new or better performance facilities have been built, and the vision of greater community participation in the arts around the country has gone some distance towards being fulfilled. We have the infrastructure which can revive and encourage touring, whether of art exhibitions or companies of performers. I do not propose to go into at any length what went wrong, except to say that as a society we became overconfident and practically everyone in a position to speak with some authority, government, central bank and IMF included, completely underestimated the risks, imagining that we had at least fiscally a considerable margin of safety and of course the general wisdom was that the safest investments were property and banks. 
Whether alternative prescriptions then of higher taxes, higher public spending, and less public saving would have yielded any substantially better outcomes is to be doubted. While some may have been more prescient than others, and we can all point selectively to things we expressed some concern about, almost no one foresaw in full what was coming. There was an impatience with restraints on making money, with any close regulation either domestically or at EU level strongly resisted. The reason, no doubt, last time round for the multi-millionaires against the Lisbon Treaty. The invincibility and superiority of the market was with many an article of faith. Yet today, the much despised and formerly redundant state and multinational organizations can barely cope with the flood of casualties from the sharpest economic contraction in 80 years. In the words of the Comte de Ségur, commenting on the failure of the privileged class to anticipate the French Revolution, a carpet of flowers covered the abyss, which might not have opened up to anything like the extent experienced, but for worldwide factors compounding the domestic ones. Fifty, a hundred years ago, we were an infinitely poorer country. Yet the principal justification for our independence for more than half a century preceding it, and for at least a generation subsequent to it, was Ireland's cultural distinctiveness. Indeed, Article 1 of the Constitution, unaltered in 1998, affirms not only the right of the Irish nation to self-determination, but also the right to develop its life, political, economic, and cultural, in accordance with its own genius and traditions. And these traditions still being renewed today go back some thousands of years to the passage graves of Bruna Boynia with their stone decorations, examples of which I saw last Friday visiting the Cairns of Loch Crewe in northwest County Meath. Today, in the 21st century, we would amplify in both a domestic and global context cultural distinctiveness by linking it to the concept of cultural diversity. There is no doubt that over the past hundred years we have, culturally speaking, in certain genres, punched far above our weight. Ireland's culture and heritage are a major attraction to visitors, being a reason why about half of them come to Ireland, with visits to sites and attendances at performances accounting for much of their activity here. Culture and heritage are also a significant employer, some of it seasonal, estimated as up to 64,000 people. And even if making a creative living in the arts world is difficult and challenging, though in another sense infinitely rewarding, it is an old fallacy to think that those who work in the arts are somehow of less value or priority to society than those who work in the fields, the factories, or the offices. The greatest economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, married to a ballerina, Lydia Lopakova, founded the Arts Theatre in Cambridge in 1936, which began with a performance by the Vic Wells, a ballet company which he also co-founded, directed by Cork-born Ninette de Valois. And Keynes became first chairman of the British Arts Council in 1946, a model for our own formed in 1951. The Empress Maria Theresa of Austria let herself down badly when she strongly advised one of her Archduke's sons, who was considering recruiting Mozart to his household, against employing composers and useless people like that. Much more admirable was the message from Pope Urban VIII on the day of his election in 1623 to Bernini, famous sculptor and future architect of the Vatican. It is your great good luck, Cavalieri, to see Matteo Barberini, Pope. But we are even luckier 
in that the Cavalieri Bernini lives at the time of our pontificate. In the bicentenary year of Haydn's death, it is worth recalling what Tim Blanning has written in The Triumph of Music. At the beginning of his career, Haydn became famous because he was the Kapellmeister for the Esterhazys. By the time he died, the Esterhazys were famous because their Kapellmeister was Haydn. In this summer school, we have been lucky to be able to honor in their presence great writers such as Brian Freer and Seamus Heaney. Ars longa vita brevis. Few things from past ages and civilization survive better than their art. The art of our time and of this country will be one of our more enduring legacies to future generations. They will puzzle if we do not value it as much through harder times also. Of course, in the current difficult situation, the chill winds of reduced personal incomes and reduced government support are being experienced by those working in the arts as in every other sphere with undoubtedly more to come. I would like to commend all those in the arts community for the resourcefulness with which they have coped with difficulties to date. The government's aim in the arts has been as far as possible to maintain activity and employment, even if some capital programs such as Access 3 have had to be put for the time being on the back burner. We must not, however, fall into the trap of becoming purely defensive. We need to keep to the fore a positive vision of how the arts play an integral role in the development of our country and an understanding of how they can be used not only as an asset in their own right, but as an enhancement to many other forms of activity. They should be part of every child's education. Many companies and groups actively value young talent. Every so often we see performers whom an Italian cultural phrase book would describe as un giovane astro nascente, Sara Bravo Vero, in other words, a young rising star. At the other end of the age spectrum, painting groups can give a new purpose, meaning and richness to life amongst older people. My house in Tipperary is covered with paintings, mostly of the west of Ireland, by my mother when she was in her 70s, broadly of the school of Kenneth Webb, and she was also a friend of Hilda van Stockham. In the past year, I have opened many exhibitions, both of work by young or established artists, but also amateur art groups. The Office of Public Works sometimes sponsors a local arts exhibition from which it can purchase pictures for new buildings. OPW are putting many of our heritage buildings where suitable at the disposition of festivals, helping them to keep down their costs, as well as providing them with venues that people are attracted to, but also giving them a greater sense of public ownership of historic properties belonging to the state. We have a touring exhibition of our own, the Art of the State exhibition, the state in this context being both the Republic and Northern Ireland. And I will be opening this year's exhibition in Port Stewart in August, um, sorry, early September, and Clonmel in the autumn. Uh, this year it features portraits. The artistic retreat at Anna McKerry, already mentioned, in County Monaghan, which is maintained by OPW, is managed jointly by the two arts councils, North and South, and I had dinner there with the Northern Ireland Arts Council earlier this year, from which good ideas flowed, some of them since being implemented. Culturally, there are no borders. Kulturkampf is as redundant as armed struggle, even though an older Ernie O'Malley once inverted Hermann Goering by saying, when I hear talk of guns, I reach for my culture. National cultures are receptive to other influences and sometimes contribute something that can be appreciated far away. There are overwhelming cultural reasons in addition to the political and economic ones 
for continuing to belong as a fully committed member to the European Union and not becoming, in the apt words of David O'Sullivan, a Director General with the EU Commission speaking earlier this week, a non-playing member. The Director of the Irish College in Paris, Sheila Pratchka, was in with me earlier this week. I didn't know she was going to chair this session either. <laughs> and I would be sorry if the type of exchanges that were fostered when I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs 35 years ago by the Cultural Relations Committee and latterly Culture Ireland were to fall a victim to current financial circumstances. Things we somehow managed to afford when we were poor ought to be sustainable even at a reduced level in current turbulence. In 1773, some years before the French Revolution, the Controller General of Finances, a tough-minded cleric called the Abbé Terre, who was trying to pull the state's dilapidated finances together, wanted to demolish one of the most famous royal chateaus of the Loire at Chambord as an economy measure. Luckily, the intention was never carried through. Any reorganizations and rationalizations that we have to carry through should be proportionate and recognize, respect, and appreciate the component identities and contributions of valuable institutions and ensure that they are not written off wholesale. In the 35 years I have been in one form or another a public servant, the arts, like science and a number of other policy sectors, have been part of a variety of departmental configurations. Charles Hohey took a particular interest in the arts and did much for them, but his successors gave them a department of their own. They are important enough to need to be represented directly at the government table, naturally grouped with a selection of related responsibilities. And I personally have greatly enjoyed being able to play a backup role to Minister Martin Cunham, going to many of the things I have always enjoyed attending, only more. A younger party colleague informed me in the lift a few months ago that there are no votes in the arts, compared presumably to mass sporting events. I might be tempted to respond, why not art for art's sake, but recognizing that that might not be allowed me, I would be confident that we could find the same economic justifications that other countries and cities can find for properly supporting their cultural activities. I am looking forward to seeing the rivals in the Abbey Theatre on Tuesday and may I impart with the same confidence as Mrs. Malaprop that despite having to make hard choices on diminished arts funding, the government will not turn out to be as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. Thank <laughs> you.